We're going to look at Luke chapter 10, and I'm going to read uh, verses 38 to 42. Now, as they went on their way, he entered a certain village where a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. She had a sister named Mary who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to what he was saying. But Martha was distracted by her many tasks. So she came to him and asked, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the work by myself? Tell her then to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you're worried and distracted by many things. There is need of only one thing. Mary has chosen the better part which will not be taken away from her. God, we pray that you would guide us in this look at this passage. Help us to understand. We pray that your spirit would speak to us and that you would help us to know how to, the, how to apply this to our experience as followers of Christ. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So we have been looking at what does Jesus want from us. And I'm tempted to put it out there as a quiz to see if everyone remembers all the different things that uh, that we are uh, supposed to do, the things that Jesus wants. But I'm not going to do that. I'll, 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 I'll quiz myself here. Uh, Jesus wants us to be followers. He wants us to follow him. Uh, Jesus also wants us to live lives of love. Jesus wants us to love God. Jesus wants us to love our neighbors. And Jesus also wants us to love one another as the church. And related to all of those things is that Jesus wants us to work for justice. So those are some of the things that Jesus wants from us. But I have to tell you that when I came back to faith in my early 20s and began attending church again, if I was to ask any of the the leaders in the church, um, what does Jesus want from us? I'm not sure that most of those things would make the list. In fact, I suspect that the main, what they would say is what Jesus wants from us is to go to heaven. Jesus wants us to go to heaven. And of course, I'm all, I'm pro heaven. I am definitely all for heaven. But they would say, I think that that is pretty much the main thing that Jesus wants from us. And that's not any criticism of the leadership there, because I'm very thankful for the leadership of that church, and they were very much involved in my own discipleship. But even within the congregation, as a layperson just talking with my friends and uh, people who were the same age as me, that I think it was pretty much agreed that what Jesus wants from us is to go to heaven. And that's the bulk of it. And you might think, well, maybe, maybe I misunderstood what, what the, the culture was in that church. It, it couldn't have been that simple. And yet I remember one Sunday, one of the speakers that we had, and he said from a pulpit, somewhat like this one here, He said, I have struggled for years trying to understand why is it that God doesn't just rapture us right to heaven the moment we become a Christian, the moment that we are saved, the moment we pray the sinner's prayer, why does God not just rapture us right to heaven? Because we've already accomplished our destiny as a human being. We are created to be going to heaven. And so what is the point? 
And he said after years and years of wrestling with that, he finally found the answer of why God doesn't take us directly to heaven at the moment of conversion. And that was because our job is to get other people into heaven. And that is the only reason that we're still here on earth, is to get other people into heaven. Now, based on my series so far, you might suspect that I don't fully agree with that, that I don't think that the only reason that we're here is for us to go to heaven and to get other people to heaven. Now, my fear is you're going to hear that and think, wait a minute, he is not into evangelism. He is not interested in seeing people meet Jesus. And that could not be farther from the truth. In fact, we are going to conclude our series next week looking at that very thing about sharing our faith, about building the kingdom, and all of those things. And I'm, I'm saving that one for the conclusion. I'm not dismissing uh, evangelism. I am not dismissing us, us going to heaven or helping other people going to, to heaven. Those things are a part of the story, but they're only part of the story. What we've been looking at is a rich Christian life that includes these things, but is so much more. And as we think about these things that that Jesus wants from us, I'm drawn once again to the Great Commission. And the Great Commission, which is very often used as a call to evangelism and a call to missions, when we read the Great Commission, Jesus actually tells us to go out and to make disciples, to make disciples. And I remember the first time that was, that was pointed out to me by a pastor, that it, Jesus calls us to make disciples. And I thought, he can't be correct there. It's got to be converts. We need to get people to accept Jesus as Lord. And that's what Jesus must be calling us to. And yet, Jesus calls us to make disciples. And so that's what we're going to look at. We're going to look at the next part of what Jesus wants for us, which is for us to grow as disciples. And we're going to do that by looking at the story of Mary and Martha. We know elsewhere that Mary and Martha, these two sisters, that they are the sisters of Lazarus. That's not mentioned in Luke, but we find it in the Gospel of John. And we also find that Jesus is very close with Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. They're, they're especially close. And when we think of Jesus and his ministry, we think of him traveling around and not really having a place to live. He was technically homeless in the sense that he didn't own a property, he didn't own a house that he could call his own. But most often, he probably wasn't sleeping on a sidewalk or sleeping on a park bench or anything like that. He had supporters who would invite him into his home for meals and probably to sleep the night. And some of those supporters were Mary and Martha. And so this story starts with Jesus coming into the home of Martha and Jesus sits down and the story unfolds. Now, I need to tell you, I've always had mixed feelings about this story. I understand the point that Jesus is making because Martha is there uh, doing all kinds of stuff, getting everything ready, uh, making sure everything is just right. And what's her sister doing? Just sitting there, just sitting there at the feet of Jesus. And yes, I know that that's the proper thing. And Jesus makes it clear that that's the right thing. But are any of you kind of on team Martha? <laughs> I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands. But there's part of me, when I read this story, I feel the frustration that Martha feels there. If you've ever been in a situation like that where someone's just sitting there and they could, 
lift a finger to help, but no, nope, they're not. Uh, it, it's a very, very frustrating thing. And we're left wondering, well, what is it that Jesus is saying? Is Jesus saying it's wrong to be hospitable? It's wrong to make your guest feel comfortable? It's wrong to, to offer them refreshments? Well, that can't be what Jesus is saying because elsewhere, he really lifts up hospitality and he speaks uh, a lot uh, more than a lot of other topics that we think he talks about, he speaks a lot about inviting people into our homes and and providing for them and feeding them and doing all of these things. He lifts up hospitality as one of the main virtues of being a Christian. So what is he saying? How can it possibly be that Martha is choosing something that is less important than Mary? And so to understand that, we have to look at not so much at what Mary is not doing, but what Mary is actually doing. So she's sitting there at the feet of Jesus, which we might interpret as doing nothing, but it's not. It's doing something. Sitting at the feet of Jesus is about growing as a disciple. Because what's happening at this point? It says she's sitting there listening to him as he is speaking, which actually puts into perspective what is going on. That at this time, when this conversation is taking place, Jesus's time of teaching has started. There is a time to make sure that there's enough seats. There is a time to make sure that everyone has some water or whatever it is that they need. But once Jesus starts teaching, it's time to sit at his feet and to grow as a disciple. I find it interesting that those who are concerned about women pastors, uh, that they will point out, oh, if, if uh, Jesus was open to women pastors, how come he didn't choose any female disciples? Well, actually... Mary was a disciple. She wasn't one of the 12, but the group of disciples was far larger than 12. And what Mary is doing, sitting at his feet, is the classical way a disciple would learn from a rabbi. This is the posture of a disciple. At any time in that culture and at that time, you saw someone sitting at the feet of someone you would automatically assume that they are taking on the role of disciple and the person who is sitting there uh, is the one who is teaching, the one who is the master or the rabbi. And so Mary is a disciple. And not only is she a disciple, she's growing on as a disciple. So I would say that this interplay between Mary and Martha continues today although in a slightly different way. You know those cartoons where they have uh, someone and there's a, uh, an angel on the one shoulder and a devil on the other shoulder and, and the angel's telling you to do something good and the, the devil is saying, no, you should actually do this. And we, we see that in cartoons and pictures and, and so on. In some ways, we have something like that, but with a Mary and a Martha on our shoulders. And Mary on our shoulder is saying, hey, you know what? It's time right now to spend some time with Jesus. It's, it's time right now to grow as a disciple, to sit at Jesus' feet. And the Martha on our shoulder is saying, really? Can't you think of something a little bit more productive than that? Like, surely you can do something that's actually going to make a difference. Like, let's not waste our time. And we have that interaction of, yeah, well, I really should spend some time with Jesus, but I really should actually just roll up my sleeves and get to work and do something that is very, very practical. Now, I want to say that these things are not completely mutually exclusive, as if we are only supposed to 
uh, follow what Mary says and never follow what Martha says, there is a time for us to roll up our sleeves and to do work that has to be done. That is totally the case. When we are preparing for KD lunch for the students at SCA uh, and, and people are here, I, can you imagine if, if someone asked me for help setting up the tables and I said, no, I think I'm going to read the Bible. I just want to read the Bible because that's the better thing is to be spending time with Jesus. Well, that probably wouldn't go over well, and I don't think it's what Jesus would want for that moment. Yes, there is a time for me to sit with my Bible, but there's also a time to move tables as well. But what I want to ask is, what does it mean for us today to sit at the feet of Jesus? What does it look like today for us to grow as disciples? People are going to be drawn to different things. I would suggest that that probably it's going to include prayer in scripture in some way. But what will that prayer look like? Will that be getting up at four o'clock in the morning and spending an hour on your knees praying? It may Will it be what some people call popcorn prayer, where you just give short little uh, prayers uh, every once in a while, uh, praying as you see things? Maybe it will be a walk around the village, praying for the people who live in the homes around here. For the scripture, maybe you're going to read an entire book of the Bible in one sitting. Maybe you're going to read five pages, maybe a chapter. Maybe just one verse, and you're going to reflect on that. Some people are going to be drawn to various spiritual disciplines like fasting or silence or many others. And some of these are ones that uh, Pastor Amanda has been teaching us about over the past number of months. Some people listen to podcasts or read Christian books. One of the challenges for me in this position to try to encourage you to grow as a disciple is that I cannot create a one-size-fits-all curriculum that will help every single one of you grow as a disciple because each one of you is different and you're going to respond in different ways and I can't fit that all into a formula and I don't think the scriptures tell us that we should. The point is to find out what it means for us to sit at Jesus' feet. Life is about facing challenges, challenges that come our way, challenges that we don't want. And those challenges require spiritual strength. And we build spiritual strength through spiritual exercise. But it seems so hard. So yes, I've read a chapter of the Bible. What difference did that make? I don't feel any more spiritual having read a chapter of the Bible. In many ways, it's similar to physical exercise. If you were to walk around this block here, going around Elm Street and so on, and do that once, you probably wouldn't feel any stronger or that you had any more stamina than before you had it. In fact, you might feel like you had less after, after doing it. But what if you kept doing it every day? What if you kept walking and you didn't do it just once, but you did it two, three, four, five times a day? Over time, you would feel some strength. You would notice a difference. And this is what happens when we grow spiritually, as we grow as disciples. So, What does Jesus want from us? Well, one of the things that Jesus wants from us is to grow as disciples. And that's going to happen through scripture and prayer, especially those two in some way, and many other spiritual disciplines as well. Part of that's going to happen on Sunday mornings as we worship together, as we pray together, as we hear from God's word. But it doesn't just happen on Sunday mornings. It happens throughout the week, however 
that works for you. I would encourage you to find the things that help you to come closer to Jesus. And in trying to help you to do that, one of the things that I've decided that I'm going to do is to include a discipleship moment for you to look at. And so it's in our email newsletter, but as well as the the bulletin. And today's one is about being in, out in God's creation as a, as a means of, of drawing closer to Jesus. And I'm going to try to draw from a wide variety of, of disciplines and experiences, hoping that one of these is going to be something that fits with you. Because we are all different. But our goal is the same. To be like Mary. To sit at the feet of Jesus and to grow as disciples. Let us pray. God, as we think of this story of Mary sitting at the feet of Jesus, listening to his words, soaking it in, growing as a disciple. We know that the same thing is is expected of us. And yet Jesus is not physically here with us in the same way that he was with Mary. So we pray that you would help us to find the ways to grow. That we would have that same focus that Mary had to put aside all the other things that could have been done at that time, but that were secondary to being with Jesus. We pray that you would help us to learn the way of prayer in Scripture that works for us, that we would not compare ourselves to another person who seems to do it better in our observation, but to be able to do it in a way that is honoring to the way you have created us. Help us to discover the spiritual disciplines that people have presented and written about so that we would know how we can grow. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.